it is Matthew 4.4. 4. So if you'd like to join me in your Bibles, most of the stuff is memorized. But he answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. May God bless the readers. Japanese, Korean, Thai, I love it. Um, 
I, I was having, I forget what it was, I think I was having a rough day. Um, that's right, it was a day where, and that might be a story for the day, I had cut my pinky open because I was trying to slice a piece of bread wrongly. I had it, it was frozen, and I couldn't chop it that way, so I had it this way, and I'm sawing through it. Anyway, it was a rough day. I come back home from, from the hospital, and Caitlin prepares this amazing, it was just like tofu eggplant stir fry thing. I have not had restaurant food that good, probably not. And the moment I had that food, I was like, I don't need to go to a restaurant ever again. Like, I have the chef right here. This is phenomenal. So that became the new normal. And once I had that, I couldn't go back to living life the old way. You can probably tell that I love food, right? Because I'm talking so much about it, right? And I want to suggest to you this morning that there's another food that once you try and you experience, you can't go back to living life without it. Go back to Matthew 4, verse 4. We just read this. I'm going to be, this is part one of a three-part series called Bread and Breath. We're going to be talking about the things that we as Christians, the things that are essential to us as Christians, to living our life. Bread and breath. This is part one. Matthew 4, verse 4. By the way, I mentioned this at the Kapaja, but I love Intrat Teresa. If I ask a question, feel free to respond with an answer. Don't feel like you have to stay quiet. This is a Bible study, and we're all involved. So, Matthew 4, verse 4, and it says, But Jesus answered, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Friends, Jesus here is making the claim, the very strong claim, that this food is more essential to you than whatever you had for breakfast this morning. In fact, Jesus is making the claim that this word right here, this food, is more essential and more valuable and more pleasant and more tasty and more fulfilling than whatever meal you have planned for tonight, special July 4th. This, this is the food that when you try this and you really give it a taste and experience it, Anything less than that is going to feel like you're lacking something yeah, in life. Yeah. And so today we want to explore why is that the okay, case. So bow your heads and please pray with me and for me as we invite Holy Spirit. Father God, I want to thank you so much for the opportunity to be in my church. I want to thank you for your word. Thank you that it is food that you have given to us to nourish us holistically, not just physically. I pray that your Holy Spirit would come and be our teacher speak through me. And Lord, may we leave this place with a better understanding of the essentialness of this bread, of this word that you've given us. For we ask in the name of your son. Amen. Amen. So, we want to understand what is this and why is it so essential. So, I, we're going to do some stuff that perhaps we've already studied in the past, but I think it's always good to refresh ourselves. We want to go back and understand... At the basic level, what is this, right? If we're going to understand why this thing is so essential, we have to understand, what is this thing that we hold, right? Many of us probably have not just one, but two or three copies of this in our home. But what is it really? It's the Bible. We say it's the Bible. We call it the Word of God. But do we understand what we're saying when we say it's the Word of God, right? Do we know what we mean when we say that? So, go with me to 2 Timothy chapter 3. Second Timothy is in the New Testament. It's towards the end of the Bible. It's after First and Second Thessalonians. If you want an easy way to remember where that is, there's three T's in the New Testament. Thessalonians, Timothy, Titus. They get shorter. Now you'll never forget where they are. So first and second Thessalonians. Then you have first and second Timothy. So we're in Second Timothy chapter three. Starting at verse 15. So we're trying to ask the question. What is this thing that we call the Bible? We're going to be in the Word, skipping back and forth. So have your Bibles ready, whether it's a physical one or a phone, whatever it is. For 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 15, starting there, it says, And how, yes, right here. And how from childhood you have been acquainted with the sacred writings which are able to make you up. Wise, Wise for what? Salvation. Salvation. Through faith in Christ Jesus. All what is worth it. Scripture is, what's the word that's used there? Given by God. Mine says breathe out by God. Does your word say inspirate, inspired by God? Inspired, right. Okay, so keep that in mind, right? All scripture is breathed out by God, inspired by God, given by inspiration. 
and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. So there's lots there, but I want to focus on that. This is how much of Scripture? All. All Scripture is given by what? Inspiration. Inspiration, right? My says breathed out by God. Which I actually think is a better translation of the actual word. So the actual word that's used there, um, the Bible was originally written in three languages, primarily Hebrew, in the Old Testament, Greek, and the New. And there's a little bit of Aramaic in the book of Daniel. The word that's used there, when it says inspired, breathed out by God, is theonosos. So theo, what do you think that, that's great for? Theo, God, right? Theos, God, theology, right? And then neosos. What do you think that means, literally? Pneumatic, the breath. Yeah, nostrils, right? Like uh, pneumatics, right? Breath, right? Wind. So literally it says that the Bible is God breathed. We say, okay, cool. What does that mean? <laughs> That's even more confusing. What does it mean that the Bible is God breathed? Go with me to 1 Peter. Well, I think that's 2 Peter. 2 Peter chapter 1. So don't get confused there. 2 Peter, it's a few books ahead of 2 Timothy. 2 Peter chapter 1, starting at verse 20. What does it mean that the Bible is God breathed, inspired, right? 2 Peter chapter 1, verses, starting at verse 20. And it says here, Knowing, first of all, that no prophecy of Scripture comes from what? Any kind of interpretation, someone's own interpretation. So no prophecy of Scripture is, is sourced, finds its origin in just someone's random idea. The Bible is not some random guy's idea that then got, became this truth, this whole thing that we listen to. But what? Verse 21, for no prophecy was ever produced by the will of who? But men spoke from who? As they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. So something very interesting here. The word for, so Holy Spirit, the word for spirit is actually the same word that's used for breath. Pneuma. Breath, wind. So when the when in 2 Timothy it says that the Bible is God breathed, it's literally saying that the Bible comes from through the Holy Spirit. That the Bible comes through God's breath, aka his spirit, aka the Holy Spirit. You say, okay, cool, but how does that work, right? Does the Holy Spirit just come and say, here's the Bible printed out? And what does that process look like? What does it mean that the Holy Spirit carries it along, moves on them to produce this book that we have today. So I actually want to do a little pop quiz with you all to actually discover um, how this works. I'm going to throw out a book of the Bible, and I want you to do your best job to tell me how that book came about, how it was written, what it is, basically. So here's an easy one. Song of Solomon. What is that book? The Song of Love. So, so it's a love story, right? It's a love letter between two people. That's inspired by, by God. The book of Deuteronomy. Who wrote that? Moses. Moses. What is he writing about? The law. The law. And if you look at Deuteronomy, it says that these are the laws that God commanded me to tell you, right? So Deuteronomy is Moses passing on that which God told him. In the book of Daniel, Daniel receives certain things in his mind. What are those? Visions, right? He writes those down, right? The book of Luke, how does the book of Luke start? Before the challenge, what does Luke say in chapter 1? This is actually a very specific thing. To my friend, right? What's Luke, what is Luke saying? I'm writing you what? An account of what? Of what I've heard, right? So Luke is really, the book of Luke is him going around grabbing historical records and first witness, eyewitness accounts of what happened. It's a historical biography of the life of Jesus. The book of Ephesians, who wrote that? Paul. To? And what is it? To letter. To letter. So you just quoted me, you just told me that the, all these things that we consider scripture a love song, laws, a letter, his, history, right? And we can even go with so many other. All of this 
All of it is scripture, and therefore all of it is inspired by God, which is which means all of it is breathed out by the Holy Spirit. Here's what I want to suggest something to you. The Bible, this book, is a collection of writings of a variety of things. We often think that the Bible is just, oh, it's just a book of rules of what things to do and what not to do. Maybe some of you have heard basic instructions before leaving Earth, the abbreviation of of the Bible. Some of us think, oh, the Bible is just these instructions. Friends, the Bible is so much more than that. The Bible is a collection of human beings like you and I from different cultures across different times with different personalities, with different struggles. And there's two parts to this, and I want you to capture this. God, in various ways, revealed himself to people in Scripture. To Moses, it was through the burning bush, right? Through Paul, it was when it, he, he got knocked off of his horse and he met Jesus, right? So in various ways, God reveals himself to people, either through a vision, physically, through a voice, however the case may be. There's revelation, and then this is actually a product of what we call inspiration. So there's two parts to the Bible. Number one is what? The revelation, the, the, the human being realizing that there's a divine reality that they're encountering, and then the actual part of writing this down is the what? The inspiration, and that's where the Holy Spirit comes. And as the writer is writing, the Holy Spirit comes and guides the mind of the author to write exactly what it is that God wants him to write. Now, I'm going to make a claim here that might seem controversial, but I want you to follow me. It is not the specific individual words of Scripture that are inspired. Let me say again. And I'm going to explain this. It is not the specific individual words of Scripture that inspired. What was inspired were the men who, after receiving this revelation, God moved up on them and through their own personalities, characteristics, culture, wrote down the things that now give witness to who God is. And why do I say, make this distinction, that the men, not the individual words, are inspired? Because... The Bible, I'll give you an example. In the Gospels, you will find that one of the, the Gospel says that when Jesus came to the demoniac across the lake, there was just one guy. You go to another Gospel, it says that there was how many? There was two. Well, so if the individual specific words are inspired, God is telling us two realities that are logically impossible. But we know that the, the point of the gospel is not to tell us how much men were specifically there. It's to communicate what? That there's a man, Messiah, who comes and can free pe people from the power and bondage of Satan. That's the point. That's the inspired message. So I want you to understand that people write things like love letters. And even a love letter, the Holy Spirit can come in and transform that into the inspired word of God. Yeah. Revealing through a man and a woman's love relationship how much God loves us. And so from all these historical accounts, we have this book, the inspired word of God that came through revelation, number one, and then two is what? Inspiration. Inspiration. Right. So now, then the point is, what is the purpose of Scripture, right? So we have a better idea, a broad idea of what, of what this is, how it came about. What does it do, right? What's the purpose? So I want your help. Someone go back. I'm going to spread some Bible verses around. I want you guys to help me read these. So someone go, go back to 2 Timothy 3, when we were verses 15 through 17. Who's my volunteer? Yeah. Anyway. I'll do and today, okay. Can I get another volunteer? Someone else. I'm going to give, give you, okay. Mar Maria, can you go with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 11? 1 Corinthians 10, 11. Can I get another volunteer? Okay. With the pink hat. I don't know your name. Your, your, your Gina. name? Gina. Gina. And Gina. Can you go to Revelation 1, verse 1? So, Revelation chapter 1, verse 1. Yes. Oh, yes. Okay. One more. One more volunteer. Auntie Debbie. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 17. Okay. Cool. Caleb, okay, can you do me a favor? Can you do Hebrews verses chapter 4, verse 12? Thank you. I'll do the last one. Okay, so starting at 2 Timothy, can you guys read, can someone, whoever has that, read 
verses 15 through 17. What is the purpose, the point, the object, the goal of scripture? Of scripture? And that from childhood you have known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. Okay, so we got a broad reason after that. The Bible is for the sake of what? Making us wise unto? Salvation. So, so that we can... The Bible is there to help us learn and receive salvation, but then also for a number of things, for teaching, correction, reproof, basically for teaching us how to live life well so that we can then produce good works, right? So there's that. 1 Corinthians 10, verse 11. Now all these things happen to them as examples, and they were written for our admonition, upon whom the end of the ages have come. Thank you. So it says now all these things. What things is that referring to? Do you think? Things written down. About who? <laughs> of all the people, all these stories, right? So the Bible is not just instruction; it's stories for the sake of teaching us how to learn from the mistakes of them of the past, so that we can then learn how to live well in the present, right? So it's not just instruction; it's stories, histories, right? Um, Revelation one verse one. Can you read that? Did you? The revelation of Jesus Christ that God gave him to show his servants things which must shortly take place. And then he signified it by his angel to his servant John. Awesome. So then, what's another reason the Bible is given to us? To show us what? To reveal Jesus, yes. Specifically, the things that are what? To come, right? To reveal the future and to reveal Jesus. Yes, yeah, so we're gonna. She knows that the message are this is good. This is awesome. We're hinting at it. So, to reveal, so instruction, salvation, history, so we can learn to know the future. The next verse there, um, Ephesians six seventeen. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Okay, so the 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 Bible's called what? The word of God. The word of God. The word of God, but it's all, but it, it's a sword, right? The Bible is a is a sword, right? So, a sword to do what? To hang it up on a wall and look nice. What do you use a, a sword for? To kill. To, yeah, to kill. To fight, right? And if you read earlier in Ephesians six, it says that we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against what? Principalities and power, right? So, the Bible is not just history. It's not just rules. It's not just help, helping us know what the future holds. It's our weapon to resist the schemes, the lies of Satan. Amen. One more. Hebrews 4. First yes. Uh, no. Yeah. Hebrews. <laughs> yes. 4.12. She hasn't better than that. For the word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of soul and spirit and of joints and marrow and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. So this is an interesting verse, right? So Ephesians 6, 17 says that the Bible is the sword of the spirit, right? So, and in Ephesians 6, who is it used against? In Ephesians. Principal, right? The, the forces of, of darkness, of, of evil. In Hebrews chapter 4, it says that the Bible is a what? A two-edged sword. So does it cut one way? It cuts one way and the other way. And who is the who is the one being cut, so to speak, in Hebrews 4.12? We are. If you read it, can you read it one more time? Go. For the word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of soul and spirit, and of joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. So you realize that the Bible is not just your weapon? I want you to notice, the Bible is not just used to fight back against the enemy. The Bible cuts you too. And the Bible cuts you so that you can understand what's really inside your heart. This is very fascinating. Many of us who have confronted, who have been confronted by scripture, I'm, I'm sure at, at, at sooner or later you've read a verse that says, I don't like that. And the reason you don't like it is because it's calling you out on something that you know you probably shouldn't be into. 
or it's calling you to do something that you really don't want to do. So the Bible is a double-edged sword. It doesn't just cut one way. It cuts the other way. So is that a pretty good overview, would you say, of the Bible? Yeah? Have we done justice? Yeah? We haven't. We have not. Now, what I'd suggest is Maria hinted at this. But if not for what she had said, if you were to exclude that, if we were to just stop at the, the definitions we gave, we would be no better off than the Jewish people in Jesus' day. What do I mean? The Jewish people in Jesus' day oftentimes treated the Bible as if it was just merely information to be known. As if it was just merely a list of do's and, and, and don'ts. As if it was just merely basic instructions before leaving earth. Friends, if that's the definition of the Bible that you have, you will live your life in vain and you will come to a dead end. You're using the Bible wrong. Because we're missing the most important thing about Scripture. Go with me to the book of John chapter 5. In the words of Jesus himself. John chapter 5, verse 39 and 40. The Bible is the things that we mission, but that's not close to the most important thing. John chapter 5, verse 39. I want you to really capture what Jesus is saying here. He says in John chapter, uh, chapter 5, verse 39, it says, You search the scriptures because you think that what? That in them you have eternal life. And it is they that bear witness about, about me, about Jesus. Yet you refuse to come to me that you may have life. Jesus is making the claim that if you use scripture for anything less than coming to ultimately know who he is, you're using the Bible wrong. These Jewish leaders in Israel, and I trust just many of us Christians today, unwittingly try and use the Bible as just rules, just a way to know what to do, just information to know so that I can feel like I know what's going on in the world and others don't. But if that's where we stop, we're actually not finding life. We're not really using the Bible for what it's supposed to be used. The Bible is supposed to lead us to Jesus. And you see this in Luke chapter 24. Go to Luke 24 real quick. We're hopping around a lot here. This is good. It's a Bible study after all. Luke 24. I want you to notice this. This plays out in the life of Jesus' disciples. Luke chapter 24. Starting at verse 25. Luke 24, verse 25. A little bit of background. The disciples have just witnessed Jesus die. And they're on a walk a few days after. And they're discussing the unfortunate reality that the guy that we thought was going to arrest us is now dead. And now we've spent the last three and a half years following him. What are we going to do? Like everything just fell apart. And so here Jesus meets them. And he asks them, what are you guys talking about? And they explain to him. And so the disciples explain to Jesus, though they don't know it's, it's him. They explain to him what they feel like, you know, this man died, we thought he was our Messiah, our leader, but he's not. And then Jesus says in verse 25, O foolish ones, and slow of heart to believe, how much? All that the what? Prophets have spoken. Was it not necessary that the Christ should suffer these things and enter into a glory? Notice this. And beginning with what? Moses said, all the prophets, he interprets them in all the scriptures and things concerning who? So, what was the Bible that Jesus and his disciples had? They didn't have the Gospel of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and everything else. That was, that was what they were living out, right? So their Bible was the Old Testament. Moses and the prophets. How much of the Old Testament is that? Moses, the first five books. The prophets is, oh, right? Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Daniel. Some people would even include Psalms in there, right? So Jesus is basically saying, let me show you how everything in the Old Testament talks about who? Talks about me. So what did, phrase it for me, what did the Old Testament say about Christ? You can summarize it into one sentence. That he was what? Coming and what? 
He was going to suffer and die. And, die and, and resurrect and for the sake of who? Us. So what you're telling me is that the Old Testament was a giant collection of writings that tell us what Jesus was going to come and do. So then what does the New Testament tell us about Jesus? That he actually did those things, right? And what he's doing now, right? In the sanctuary right now, and you're singing for us. So Jesus is basically saying, this book, the first half, part one and part two, part one is what I was, is saying to you what I'm going to do. Part two is what I did and what I am doing. So friends, this book is, I want to suggest to you this idea that has changed the way I view the, the Bible. This book is a story. It's specifically a story about a man named Jesus. And it's talking to about what he was going to come and do, that he came and did it, how he did it, and then what he wants to do for us. So this book, don't view it merely as a list of rules and information. This book is a story. You're holding in it a story. But here's the really awesome part, friends. Jesus came to do what? Again. To save, to save who? Us. us. So if the Bible is a story of Jesus coming to save you and I, then the Bible is not just a story about Jesus, it's a story about who? Us. It's a story about us. Your story is in here. Praise the Lord. We thought about that. That because this Bible tells the story of Jesus and Jesus was all about saving you, this Bible tells the story of you and I. Amen. And so what I want to suggest to you here as we come to a close is this, friends. That the Bible is what reveals our identity, our value, our purpose, and how to live that purpose out. How? Jesus, by his life and death, showed you and I who we were. We were his. Made in his image. By his life and death, he shows us that we're valued. By his life and death, he shows us that our purpose is to tell us about him and become like him. And by his life and death, he shows us that we're supposed to live life by faith. So everything you could ever want, your, your identity, your value, your purpose, and how to live that purpose out, it's in this story. It's in here. So if you're ever wondering, what am I supposed to do with my life? Who am I? Do I matter? What should I do with my life? How should I live my life? There's things I want to see in my life change. I don't know how to see them change. Go to the book. The book told me that you're valuable. The book told me that you have a high calling in this life. The book told me that faith is the key to you living your best life. The book told me that you have yet to live the best life that you can possibly live. And it's all in you. And people will say, and I've heard this, people say, well, all I need is Jesus. Yeah, religion's cool, yeah, all this is cool, but all I need is God, all I need is Jesus, all I need is the Holy Spirit talking to me. How do you know who the Holy Spirit is? How do you know who Jesus is if not for this thing? And how do you know that the Spirit that's talking to you is the Holy Spirit? There's many spirits, but just one Holy Spirit. And friends, just think, we can't trust ourselves, and we can't trust the world to tell us how to live our lives. And then here's the thing. Your view of reality is going to be shaped by something. It's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when and how, and who and what. Something and someone will shape how you view yourself, your life purpose, your value. We can only trust and count on this because this is the word that Jesus himself chose. Right? He revealed himself through this. And so now he inspired people to write about this. And so here we have it so that we may know who we are. Um, this Wednesday night at prayer meeting, as we, we, we close, Auntie Denny shared a really cool story with us. So, um, many of you are familiar with her son, Pelly, and his wife, Jennifer. Jennifer's not been doing too well, right? She's going through. Yeah. Yeah. That's it. So, um, Auntie Denny shared with us that she was texting her son and not. This doesn't happen often, but she just felt the Lord impress her with this verse that she had heard. It says, as the Father has loved you, so I have, uh, as the Father has loved me, this is uh, Jesus speaking, as the Father has loved me, so I have loved you, right? This verse comes to and she said, oh. she just felt impressed to share that with her son, which is not something that she usually does. So she chanced it, she sent the verse, 
and her son, who's not been someone that's been necessarily in the presence of God for person or seeking it, who's been kind of doing his own thing, text back, I abide in his love. Praise the Lord. This is something, this is him declaring that he abides in God's love after having wandered from that love. I want to suggest something though. Auntie Denny could not have known. The spirit would not have been able to tell her what to share if she didn't already have this in her mind. It is when the word is lived out in us, when we consume this, when we eat it, so to speak, when we dwell on it and consume it, that's when the Holy Spirit can then come and lead us in living out life. And it's a life, I don't have time to show us but the, the best evidence that this thing can change your life is the life that is what you're going to experience as you read it. Auntie Denny experienced it firsthand. She saw a son who's been wandering away from home coming back home because of something she encountered in here. So if you're wondering, what's my value? What do I do in life? Where do I go? How do I live life well? I want to challenge you. Find it in here. Because in here, you're going to find the story of Jesus. And in finding the story of Jesus, you're going to find your story. You want to know who you really are, what you're truly capable of, what your value is, where you're headed? I promise you, friends, it's in here. I've read it. It's in the book. So, the question today is, who will join me in cho choosing to not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God? Let's pray. Father God, thank you so much for this bread from and Lord, we know that your son Jesus is the true bread that comes from heaven. But Lord, in this word, we, are, we have the testimony of that bread. So Father, we want to consume this. Help us, Lord, to make this our daily bread. To consume it, and therein, as we find your story, to find our story. Thank you, Father, for revealing yourself to us. We ask in the name of your son, for his sake. Amen. Now, in response to this bread, we're going to sing... The song, Give Me the Bible to Sunny Joe. I want to invite you to sing that song as we respond to God. Give me the Bible, star of gladness, gleaming.
this morning we want to declare. We want to receive your word with joy. Give us our daily bread, your word, that we may live our lives with joy and peace and hope and confidence in you so that you come back to take us home. For we pray it in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, and for his sake. Let everyone say, Amen. Amen. Happy Sabbath, church family.